So we have on our panel, Lou Skerritt, Alex Claire Young, Jide McCauley, Chris Dowd and Chris Beardsley. While we've been talking, there's been quite a lot of um, questions and I will come to that in a moment. But if each of the panel wouldn't mind, because the only people that know who you are are the people who've been in your breakout group. So it might be nice just to spend a few minutes um, talking a little bit about uh, who you are. So um, Alex, I can see you there, although you've got a fish in front of your face. Um, I don't know what that's doing there. But um, Would you like to just um, say who you are and what brings you here today? Yeah, um, so my name is Alex. I'm a minister in the United Reformed Church. Um, I'm a trans masculine and non-binary person. I spend most of the time, my time at the moment, doing research for a PhD. I'm looking at what trans, non-binary and non-conforming Christians have to say about theology, basically. Um, and the rest of the time I am facilitating an online church, which is called True Spacious, um, which happens to have a lot of LGBT members as well. And I'm really passionate about queer visibility and trans visibility. So I'm really glad to be here. Mm, thank you. Um, Tina, would you like to just introduce yourself? Yes, hi, I'm, I'm Tina and um, I'm a retired Church of England priest. I help out in my local parish in Fulham. I was a healthcare chaplain um, for um, 16 years and worked in parish before that. I transitioned in 2001. And since then, I've been involved in LGBT activism for inclusion in the church and I've um, co-edited or authored um, three books about being transgender and Christian of which trans affirming churches which we looked at in our group this afternoon is the third. Thank you and and uh, you, you also did, some, did the work with Chris as well so Chris do you want to come in and just talk a little bit about your background as well? Yeah, okay, yeah. My name is Chris Dowd. I am, uh, Tina and I have been writing together now what feels like for years, Tina, um, in a good way. Um, uh, I am a gay man. I also am a minister in the United Reformed Church, um, such as Alex, and also, unlike G-Day, was originally from Metropolitan Community Churches as well. Um, I began um, researching and writing my doctorate um, on the pastoral care of gender variant people um, in about 2003, I think I started. At that time, it was not a topic that anybody knew very much about at all, but suddenly by the time I managed to finish my doctorate 10 years later, it seemed to be one of those things that everybody wanted to talk about, which is fantastic. And, and like Tina, you know, we've written, there are three books. I was a contributor in the first one, and then Tina and I have written the, the other two together. Lou, I feel like we know you well and we don't know much about you. Oh, I feel like you've seen you've seen a lot of me today. You've seen my sitting room and everything. So, um, uh, but yeah, just very very briefly, um, my name is Lou. Um, my gender is quite topsy turvy um, in all sorts of different ways. Um, I um, am based in Sheffield. Um, and um, I do sort of lay ministry within my local parish church. I'm part of the Church of England. Um, I'm also doing a doctorate um, in Durham at the moment, um, focusing on queer priestly presence um, and the body of Christ at the Eucharist. So what it means to embody that uh, at, at the Eucharistic table. Um, and I'm also a trustee of One Body, One Faith. Okay, no, that's great, thank you. And last but not least, G-Day. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, I'm Judy McCauley. I'm the founder and um, also the CEO of House of Rainbow. Um, I definitely have a background with the Metropolitan Community Church, as many people have heard. And um, I'm actually very passionate about reconciling faith and sexuality for queer people. And I think it's very important. And also very passionate about providing pastoral care uh, for people uh, within our communities, families and friends in included in that as well. And I'm just extremely jealous of Tina, Lou, and Chris, and Alex for having a PhD. So I'm going to be dreaming of having one myself. But I know it takes a lot of hard work, but it is on my mind. But I mean, I have to say that we, I, we actually got Tina's first two books, and I'm looking forward to getting the third one, now that I know about it. 
uh, we need those tools, um, not just on our shelf, but um, we need to use them as well for the sake of the work that we do. Thank you. Okay, that's great. Um, I feel quite intimidated by this illustrious panel, to be honest. Uh, I may have a PhD with a PhD, but it's not in theology. Um, it's in it's in nursing and organisational change. So I, I feel a little intimidated by all of these amazing uh, PhDs. Probably a little like you, G Day. But having said that, I'm quite impressed by the fact of the things that people are studying. Now, there's been some chat on the chat um, to ask about, you know, uh, people making comments more than questions, but I think it might be worth opening up some of those. So um, Pamela Gold put, it is important to invite congregations to look at these matters. Um, and I, I think all the matters we've talked about, really, many will not come across uh, trans or genderqueer. Um, she says, I take every opportunity to speak out to people in my congregation and the groups in involved with. Most are open to the conversation and every conversation is an opportunity to move forward. So that's kind of a broad context. But I think coming out of the question with that is how, how do we have conversations with people to raise these issues? Because I think that's quite challenging. Um, so Chris, would you like to come in on that one? Well, I, I've just moved churches. I was I was in Yorkshire and I moved down to Birmingham. Um, and, and one of the ways that I have been working with the church since I got here, which is I got here literally just before lockdown, um, is we've been doing liberation theology as a Bible study. And so what that's been, so what we've done is we've looked at, say, five, no, we looked at eight different types of liberation theology and that has opened up all sorts of questions about things like gender and sexuality, but also ecology and, you know what I mean, and race and all sorts of things. So therefore, when we're talking about these things, we're talking about them in a way that we're learning. And I think if people feel, and if we give people the opportunity to learn, I actually feel most people not only understand but actually become wildly supportive it's interesting out of the liberation theology group several committees have started looking at various things that we need to fix in the church and i could have stood in the pulpit and said we need to do these things but actually by doing these bible theology these bible studies and allowing people to explore and come to their own conclusions that's empowered people to make to to act themselves which is much more effective so it's, it's rather than coming head on you kind of do it gently in the sense you're looking at a broader issue and then trying to pull out those issues is that do you find that that works better absolutely and i think i think one of the things as well as with with things like with liberation theology and, and the bible the bible is such a queer document when you really start digging into it properly that i find it really hard to see how people don't see it like that but for me, by allowing people to begin to do theology themselves and, and, and for them to join the dots themselves, therefore, they are empowered to do it. And also then they talk to other people about it. And then there's a reason to do something. Because I think sometimes when we try to do these things, particularly as a minister, um, they can feel imposed on people. Whereas actually, if you help people to discover the reason why these things need to change, then actually people take it on board and they run with it. Yeah, okay. Um, Alex, do you have a, a, a perspective on this in terms of your own ministry? Because you obviously, you have a different kind of ministry and, and you engage with people in different ways. Yeah, I think there are kind of two tensions at play here. One is the tension between kind of being a human being um, and being an advocate, and the other is the tension between talking about and talking to. And those tensions don't play very well with each other, but actually something that I've found has been really important for helping churches to understand identities is by actually inviting people in to talk about their own identities. I have found that lots of churches that are really quite hostile to trans identities when it's talked about in abstract, uh, cease to be so when a trans person actually comes in and talks to them. Um, and now, in some ways, it's easier than ever when we're meeting on Zoom and things like that. You know, you don't have to travel up and down the country. So uh, there are out trans advocates, several of them are in this room. There are out LGBTQ plus advocates. Get them to come in and talk, but don't necessarily expect the LGBTQ plus members of your own congregation to do it. 
because there is that tension and that balance, I think, between creating safe space and being able to share our stories. Having said that, a lot of LGBTQ plus people really want to share their stories. And I think one of the things I've discovered through online church is that a lot of people find social media and other online forums to be a really safe space to do that. Mm. Yeah, uh, uh, Leslie's put a, a comment in the chat saying, unfortunately, a lot of people left my church because the minister agreed with the Church of England's ordination of LGBTQ plus ministers. And um, they're saying I'm still having to be careful about who I am in the congregation to avoid another schism. Uh, however, their ministry is totally supportive and often use diversity as a theme in services. So there is a challenge there, isn't there? Is that um, when we start opening up the, the discussion, people feel vulnerable. Um, you know, they, they don't want to cause a schism, but they feel vulnerable, particularly if they don't know what, what reception they will, will get from um, the church. Um, and, and, and I mean, I know we talked about that G-Day, didn't we, in our own group, in terms of um, the, the reaction of people and how you deal with that. Well, I mean, I think that for me, it's really about being yourself. And I think that, you know, Chris started to touch on, on, on the process that he has used. For example, the Bible study is a classic one. It's a very good one. It means that we take people on that journey of learning. Uh, I think that, you know, if we're able to be ourselves, we, of course, not just within reason, we have to feel safe as well. Now, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it, when people see me, I'm also very effeminate. I'm very camp. And there are sometimes that I lose myself in my campness. And then, then you get the odd, strange look about why are you standing like that? But if I'm able to be myself in all totality, then that is actually good for the church. But some of my strategy has also been Bible study. And I'll also add to it, you know, because I'm, I work outside of the church as well, when I go to events like um, Pride, when I go to the AIDS conference or, or the PrEP conference, or even issues like Black Lives Matter, I bring them into conversation in the church. I use them as a preamble in my sermon, especially uh, if, if I want to address some of those issues. So people get to see you and know you and understand where you stand on many issues. Of course, outside of church with House of Rainbow's work, we have two programs that we do. One is called Querying the Bible. You know, we invite people to a space where we queer the Bible together, we look at it. And I just love it when Chris said the Bible in itself is a queer document. It is rightly so. And of course, the other one, quite quickly, is welcoming. If the church is honest, if the parish is honest about welcoming LGBT people, honestly speaking, put a rainbow flag out in the church somewhere. Put a notice on the notice board to say that gay people are welcome here and follow it up with an action. You know, uh, statements are not good enough. Or if you put it on the website that we're an inclusive church and you do not act on it, you're not inclusive. I mean, one of the things that um, uh, Reverend Sharon Ferguson has put up is that I think it's important that people consider the language they use. And she said, personally, uh, they, they said, personally, I struggle with being referred to as an issue and be described as non-conforming. I think, yeah, I think, I think I'd agree with that. Um, and I don't know whether, Lou, I mean, given the fact that you are, you're breaking the boundaries in your discussion, did, did you want to have a conversation regarding how we use language and how we view things as an issue? Mm -hmm. Well, I think issue is a issue is a bit of an easy word, isn't it, to use? Um, and it's a catch-all, um, but I prefer to um, not use the word issue um, because actually it's the idea that we are the problem and that's that's not that's not the case the structures and the systems are the problem um, and that's been if anything um, really highlighted over the past few months in the pandemic um, because we've suddenly seen um, or for lots of people they've seen the injustice and um, that has been going on under the surface in this country and globally um, it's kind of hit them in the face everything's been a little bit closer to to home um, so I think if I if I was going to ever talk about something like that, I would say the topic of so you know just to kind of neutralise it a little bit in in the sense of, of of saying that this is this is a topic like like any other topic, um, but I suppose when it comes to when it comes to language, I mean language is is such a shifting thing, isn't it? Language always flows and changes and shifts, um, and it's and it and you know it is very very fluid. But we have to get away from the idea that. Um, everybody else is deviating from the norm 
if somebody is queer or someone is trans or however they identify that's not heterosexual and cis, that they're deviating from the norm. Because actually, if we see that as the central point, then we all crumble around it. That's not the aspiration that, you know, society is telling us that cis, white, straight man is, is the top, is the top body, the top person, but actually none of us will never live up to those expectations. So that shouldn't be our main focus as, 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 as from that. Um, it's about reclaiming ourselves in our identity and in our wholeness completely for, for, for who we are. Um, I don't know if that helps a little bit at all, but, or even just opens up, opens up the discussion about, about how we, how we talk about ourselves or, or how we describe ourselves to other people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, Alex, you've put a nice uh, comment in. Did you want to come and expand that? You're talking about reclaiming language to use for ourselves as a legitimate and important huge yeah, thing. Just, um, so I agree completely about issue and it's been something that I've found quite difficult is repeatedly being described as an issue. I think words like non-conforming are really complicated and come into this similar category as words like queer. So it was me that used the word non-conforming. And the reason I used it is because I personally identify as non-conforming in terms of gender. And lots of the people that I have interviewed identify as non-conforming. So we have actually chosen to reclaim those terms because we've been told that we don't conform. And we've said, no, actually, do you know what? I don't want to conform. I would never use that word about someone else. But it's like queer. It's one of those words that those of us who choose to reclaim it um, need to be allowed to, to use the language that we feel comfortable using to describe ourselves. Yeah. yeah I, I, I echoed that. And I'm aware that Tina Howard spoken. Um, I, I think that the word queer for me is acceptable. Um, I actually also prefer to call myself a homosexual. Uh, I just love that word for me. And I think really sometimes it's also being mindful about others as well. I mean, I do struggle with non-conforming because I, I think that Shannon is right to some extent. But at the same time, if people say that they are non-conforming, then we need to be able to celebrate that for them and with them and not take it back. I wouldn't want someone to say, no, you're a gay man, you're not a homosexual. I am both a gay man and a homosexual. And when you think about it as a black man, it's quite troublesome um, in a way, because they just don't want me to say that word. They just think it's too extreme and, and um, vulgar in, in, in itself, but I claim it back. Mm -hmm. did, you, did you want to come in, Tina? I looked as though you were going to say something. The first chapter of Trans Affirming Churches, I wrote this first line. This book is not about an issue, it's about people. It was Canon Mark Oakley, wasn't it? I think in his coming out talk at Greenbelt, he entitled it An Issue, An Issue. We all fall down. <laughs> and, you know, issues in human sexuality has all that kind of language has been used basically to objectify us and make us the problem rather than acknowledging that actually the church has got the problem. It's very difficult for us to escape from this idea of normal. I'm following a, 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 a young gay man at, at the moment on um, Facebook who was a, ordained as a very traditional Catholic priest, and he keeps using the word normal. And I, I realize why he, do, he does that. But um, I can remember being with a friend of mine, um, a, a, dear, a dear woman, ordained deacon, she never went forward for priesthood, and her granddaughter had learning disabilities. And she was saying, she'd come to the point where it was just really wonderful to celebrate that they were not a normal family. It, it's yes. just so restricting being normal. I'd like to know what normal means. Yes. <laughs> um, you, you end up going back to normative, but actually we're all a beautiful, uh, diverse range of people um, and, and how we capture that in our language and the way we work. Um, and um, Chris, I know you put your hand up. Did you want to add something to that? Yeah, I, I was just going to add to what Tina was saying, is, is, is I think one of the things is that sort of how the church has controlled people is they have othered them. So when you're, when you're other, that allows 
the the main group of people to be able to ignore you or actually trivialize you because you're actually not part of them. And I think one of the things that, that we really need to do, and I think one of the, the amazing thing about particularly interviewing families of, of in, in um, our last book was actually seeing also the journey that people um, go on and the families go on and, and their learning and, and how they change as well. And I think one of the things that sometimes we don't talk about enough is actually the blessings that we that, that queer people give, not just to, to you know to the whole church because it stops because it makes us start looking at things that sometimes we're uncomfortable about. But actually, one of the things we need to say to people is being uncomfortable. If you're uncomfortable, it doesn't mean you're right. Yeah. If you're being uncomfortable, that probably means you need to listen and learn a little bit more in order to work out. Um, work out what's going on, and also how do we how do we how do we make sure we remain in relationship during that time? And I think that's something that's really important. Sorry. Yeah. No, 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 that's fine. And Gide, you also put your hand up uh, when uh, Tina was talking. Did you have something to yeah, add? To that? I, mean, I, I just I just want to quickly echo um, um, Chris. I, I think that queer people are indeed a blessing, uh, and when you look at what the church is missing out, uh, particularly for clergy in the Church of England who also have uh, in relationship were blessed with a partner who can also equally be a blessing to the church and because of that disparity uh, in how they are treated it means that the blessing stays away and I think I totally agree with Tina as well um, of course when they talk about the issues of human sexuality um, no one is an issue we are all dearly beloved children of the living God. Mm -hmm. Mm, absolutely. Um, Kieran's put up, he's, he's obviously challenging my what is normal anyway. He's put normal means statistically common, i.e. the majority. That shouldn't mean that being part of a diamond minority is a problem. And I, and I totally agree with that. It's just because we don't fit, uh, are within a majority. But to some extent, majority hides things, doesn't it? We are diverse. And even those who might identify themselves as cis are still have a, have a range of experience and, ex, and a range of um, uh, ways that they might describe themselves. And, it, and I suppose um, there's a difference between using a word about yourself and other people and using a word because it, it has different intentions. And I think that's absolutely right. I think, um, I think we should, I, I mean, I think we should claim words and actually use them in a positive way rather than allow people to use them as a slur. One of the humorous things that was put up um, that they were talking about, um, uh, what does it mean to be normal? And Stephen D has said, if I could recall correctly, normal means 90 degrees to the plane. So I, I, I like that idea that it's, 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 it's kind of a nonsense, isn't it, really? Um, but in terms of knowing about the way we talk and the way that we introduce things for people who don't know how to do that within their own context um, does anybody have any sort of um, suggestions in terms of where people can start to make inroads because you know just starting off a bible study or starting off a, a group might not be where people are at maybe people want just to have conversations with people um, and how do you have those conversations in a positive way? Um, I don't know. Tina, would you like to start that conversation? I was thinking earlier, um, I mean, two years ago, the church that I belong to, um, our parish priests moved on. And so we had to have the conversation, not only about what was the per sort of person were we looking for to lead the church in the next phase, but what sort of church are we? And, and as we did that, we realized that our registration with um, Changing Attitude England, because that had gone, um, hadn't, uh, had, had, um, had lapsed. Sorry, that was my husband just going by. <laughs> um, and so that, that led to a conversation about, well, we are an inclusive church, what does that mean? What does that mean for us? And out of that came the realization that the person that we wanted to lead the church, it didn't matter about their sexuality. It didn't matter about their gender identity or marital status. So that was a lovely sort of 
um, outcome of that conversation. And then from that point on, uh, we've got we've recently just got registration with Inclusive Church. So that with that comes responsibility and accountability. If you're claiming to be inclusive, then I think as a church, you have to have that conversation about what does that actually mean? And that will mean uh, pulling down the resources from the, the para organization and having the conversation either formally or informally. In our session, we talked about the dangers of the, of the informal conversations where it could be gossip and having control of those is, is quite difficult. So bringing things out into the open is quite good as well. And allowing people to make mistakes. I mean, somebody, when we were having this conversation as a church about the minister, the person sitting next to me said, well, I, I feel okay if the uh, new minister is LGBT, but I'm not so sure about a trans priest if there is such a thing in the Church of England. And um, I know this has been recorded. And uh, so I then had to say, well, I'm, I'm trans actually. And they said, oh no, there it goes. I've put my foot in it again. So I think maybe people you know, can put their foot in it and that can be a conversation starter. And I'm gonna stop. No, no, that's great. Chris. One of the things I was, I was very lucky to be at the United Reforms General Assembly when we um, voted overwhelmingly 98% for same-sex marriage, um, which was an amazing privilege. But one of the things I also think is when we have these conversations, sometimes those conversations can be hurtful for us as well. And uh, particularly in that, com in, in that conference, I heard people who I knew quite well say some things that I never thought I would ever hear them say. And I think one of the things when we're willing to have these conversations, that, that's good, but I think we have to also have them in a place where not only we feel safe, but also we feel strong enough to be able to hear that stuff. Because as I say, some of it was really quite weird and quite hurtful. Um, so, and one of the things I would also be really wary about is if you do have somebody who's LGBTQ in your congregation, that doesn't necessarily mean that, that should, they should be the person that leads that conversation because they may not be in a place for that to happen. And it would be really wrong and fair and quite abusive to put them in that place. Yeah, yeah. and Susan, Susan put up, we can never be sure how safe a space, safe space really is. And I think that's absolutely true. Uh, Lou, did you want to say something? Yeah, I think I just wanted to add on to that of um, of uh, Susan's point, really, because actually, I think as much as we want to say um, this church is a safe place, for example, or this church is a safe space, that as a phrase, um, you know, within within a church community, within any community, you can never ensure that that somewhere is 100% a safe space on behalf of the gathered community that are there. So I think it's actually being realistic about what you can offer and, and something that we do in our in our church at St Mark's in, in Broom Hill, which is very, very well known for being an affirming and inclusive church and has been known for that for a very long time. We, if we have difficult conversations, we talk about that place being safe enough. You know, there might somebody might say something at some point that they might have put their foot in it, or they might say something that relates back to somebody's life twenty years ago that triggers our bad memory or something like that. And just being, we're gonna we're gonna try through different methods, through different experiences that we can be we can be safe enough um, for this conversation. And I think that's important to not set the expectations too high that we're gonna get everything perfect and everybody's gonna feel completely safe um, in 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 a hundred percent of how they're feeling. Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely right. Alex, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I love that term, safe enough. Um, I think it's one of the difficulties that there's a tension sometimes between how we label ourselves and how we actually are, and that sometimes the labeling can be problematic because we cease, we cease to do the work, we stop doing the work. Um, you know, I know churches that are registered with certain bodies that are not safe enough. Um, all churches need to keep working because things keep changing. There's things I don't know about trans identities because I'm now officially old, you know? It, it, 
things move on and we had to keep doing training. It's helpful to get people in from outside to do training, um, preferably people who are of the identity that um, is being trained about. But it's also really important that those people who are LGBTQ plus in a church are given resources for resilience because as Lou said, you can never know what's going to happen. Last Sunday, I was leading worship in a church and someone came in um, and started shouting homophobic abuse during the service. I never expected that to happen. And honestly, I hadn't been trained how to respond. Thankfully, I'm a resilient person and knew how to respond. But actually, if we want to make spaces safe for people, one of the ways to do that is to make sure that people are supported and given tools of resilience. No, that's absolutely right. Um, I'm conscious of time and I think this conversation has been really interesting and I um, really appreciate what everybody has been adding to that. And Gina, just wanted to add another comment? Okay, go ahead. Just very quickly, and I, and I think that, and, and, and I, my friends have spoken quite well, but I think that for me, uh, last year when, after the documentary Too Gay for God, uh, I think that the conversations before and after that documentary in my parish church was very, very painful uh, and, and to be quite clear. I mean, it's as if that it was dividing instead of affirming. So um, after the documentary, there were a number of people in my parish church that were really upset with me and the church. And we, we took the opportunity to have that conversation. Now, I strongly believe that we should have had more conversation before to prepare the people and, and also do a lot of pastoral work uh, going on. I don't think that at this stage, we should be begging the church to be inclusive. The church should be naturally by nature inclusive. I'm a black man, I'm a black gay man from Africa. And to be quite honest, to find myself in a church where I believe there is more inclusivity in our society only to be rejected, it actually hurts more. So, um, and, and also, uh, you know, I'm just going on with what Alex also touched on a little bit. And I think that it, this is not just about me. There could be another lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender person in the congregation. They could be very young and they're still growing up. We need to be providing that safe space for them as well, for their journey to be better than whatever journey that we might have had. Okay. And um, one of the things that have been coming across in the chat is people are asking where what where they can get some really good resources. There, there are people who are feeling that they, they want to be supportive and want to be helpful. So um, can I ask each of you just to think about what what resources you might want to offer somebody if, um, to support them in having conversations or understanding what is going on? So should we start? Lou, do you have a suggestion um i would suggest um i guess having a look at the um the one body one faith website and looking at the resources there um and also um who we are as a group of trustees and getting in contact um with us as, as trustees um as kind of ways forward and, and pointing in that sense and um, yeah. but there's lots of things going on the chat so of websites yeah, so it seems to be gathering momentum doesn't it um i think i've seen alex has been putting quite a lot of um links in um, so that's quite helpful. Does anybody specific? I know Tina, your your books um, are really helpful, and I don't know whether you want to there's talk a little bit about that. So there's this is my body, hearing the theology of transgender Christians, then trans faith, a transgender pastoral resource, and then the latest one, which is quite slim as well. It's not um, trans affirming churches. And I, I would recommend as well Inclusive Church, because I've just led the registration of our church for Inclusive Church, and they have booklets on all the different equality strands. So the work is already, is already done, it's all there, packaged for you. And there's quite a lot in the chat, and, and we'll probably collect those up and we can email those out to people. Um, is there anything else anybody would like to add, Chris? Yeah, one that I found really interesting, which is a um, American queer Jewish site, and I think it's called Trans Torah or Queer Torah. It's one or the other, and it's got a whole lot of really interesting um, Old Testament stuff, which sometimes we completely miss out on. 
Um, so it's either Quaif Torah or Trans Torah. I, mean, I think that the other resource is also pastoral care. Um, I believe that you know uh, clergy also need to get the appropriate training uh, about how to respond uh, when somebody in their congregation and their parish indeed come to them for support. Rather than be negative, they need to be more uh, positive and more understanding of those issues. In addition to that, and I say this for emphasis, uh, as a black person, it's also important that um, some of those trained are also black and people of color. And the, the main reason for that is so that we, we can apply um, culturally and traditional sensitive approach, but they have to be well trained in understanding um, some of those um, areas uh, that are of concerns for the person. Okay. Oh, thank you. And can I just thank all the people who've been on the chat? I'm really sorry if I didn't get to your comment or question. There's been quite a lot going on. I've been trying to pull th themes through, um, but I, I think um, people have really enjoyed what hearing what you've got to say and have really enjoyed your contributions. So can I say thank you for that?